Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Richard McKenzie, the Walter P. Gherkin Professor of Enterprise and Society at the Paul Mirage School of Business at the University of California, Irvine. He is the author of Why Popcorn Costs So Much at the Movies and Other Pricing Puzzles. Richard, welcome to Econ Talk. Good to be with you, Ross. Richard, you live in Southern California, and as you point out early in the book, Southern California is prone to periodic water crises. Uh, many people are aware of the fact that it doesn't rain much in Southern California. But you suggest that, strangely enough, that that isn't the source of the problem. Why not? Isn't it just a fact that it doesn't rain much in Southern California, so they they run out of water now and then? Well, the issue of water crisis in Southern California is one I love to bring up with my MBA students at at the start of the year. I ask them, why do we have these crises? And immediately... uh, They'll raise their hands and interject that um, it just doesn't rain much. And it only rains about 11 inches a year, which puts us in uh, desert uh, climate. And, uh, and I um, sort of ask them, well, you know, that's, that's a very interesting uh, answer, and it would be a great answer in a class in thermos, you know, new, I mean, atmospheric physics. Uh, but this is a class in econ, and... Uh, so I ask them to press even harder, and they they look sort of puzzled. And and I I come back to them. I said, look, it doesn't rain much water in Southern California, but it also doesn't rain any Mercedes Benz in Southern California, or, or or Snickers candy bars. Why do we have crises in in water, but not in Snickers candy bars or or Mercedes Benz? If we have a crisis in Mercedes Benz. It, you know, since I live near, uh, upscale Newport Beach, it's, uh, you know, six or ten of them cl- crash, uh, at an intersection. Um, and, uh, that sort of, you know, brings them to the point that maybe, maybe the price has something to do with it. And in the case of Mercedes Benz, if the demand for Mercedes goes up, then the price goes up. If the supply of Mercedes is, is undercut, then the price, uh, goes up. In, in Southern California, where you have, uh, uh, sometimes some unusual droughts. Uh, uh, the price is not allowed allowed to rise. It's, it's government controlled, and as a consequence, you're you're likely to get these uh, shortages. And and when we do have these shortages, and we've had one uh, uh, this year or last uh, winter, um, uh, we have you know the public officials uh, coming out appealing for everybody to cut back on water, and those appeals work to. Uh, some extent, but it, they seem to affect only about, they seem to cut the consumption maybe 3%, 5%. And, and the logic of, of continued use is, is understandable. I mean, if you're um, a homeowner and you, you sprinkle your, your grass and you want your lawn to look good, uh, then you know that uh, you're not using much water and that if you continue to use at the same old rate, it's, it's not going to affect the, uh, uh, the severity of the water crisis. So you continue to use. Indeed, if you hear other people cutting back, uh, you might uh, increase your consumption because there's more available. Or if you hear these appeals for cutbacks, you might begin to think uh, that, well, they're going to send out the water police uh, next, and you might as well uh, get your water now uh, before uh, they take more serious actions of penalizing people for having their, their sprinkler systems on. And and we have had uh, some of that. We have had water police uh, going around, as as has been the case in, say, North Carolina and Georgia over the past year or so, where they've had uh, serious droughts there. Do you live in Irvine itself? I live in Irvine, right next to uh, the campus, the University of California, Irvine. It used to be true that, I mentioned this, I think, a long time ago on a podcast, it used to be true that if you left your garage door open, for too long in Irvine, you got a ticket. Is that still true, or is that a myth? Anything? Well, it's it, these are association kind of rules uh, it, um, uh, that can be uh, enforced by the association, if not the um, uh, 
uh, uh, city uh, helps the association. Yes, in, in the association contract, uh, you're not supposed to have your uh, garage door open for more than 20 minutes at a, at a, at a time. Now, very few uh, times do you hear, have people actually enforcing it. I was just um, thinking about the garage door police. I, you know, just, <laughs> yeah. When you mentioned the well, water we do, police, I, just we reminded We do have me. grass police. Uh, there was, several years ago, somebody uh, convicted of allowing their grass to grow too long. And, uh, and of course, the arguments for all of these uh, restrictions is kind of the uh, publicness of yep. the way your yard looks and how it can uh, affect the uh, values of homes uh, in the surrounding uh, neighborhood, so I guess there's there's a logic, but but you have to understand that these rules are on the books, and uh, I've only heard of one person actually being fined for allowing the grass to get above six inches or whatever it was. So it's there. Uh, it's 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 humorous. I mean, in Irvine, I think it it, uh, it Irvine does prove that perfection is overrated. Uh, sometimes you you long for messiness yeah, uh, sure. that comes with. Uh, uh, your typical urban center here, we uh, Irvine is a um, sort of company town. Uh, the Irvine company uh, built it, and uh, of course they wanted to maximize the value of the property, so uh, they took special care to make the uh, the roads wide and the median strips green. And and let's see, the only town I've ever lived in where they not only mow the gr- median strips on a regular basis, but they edge them. And then they back up, back him up uh, the clipping. Well, that's very nice. Yeah. Well, let's let's go back to the to the okay. the rain and water problem. I, it, it's really um, I like the example a lot. One of the reasons I like it is that in last week's podcast we talked about peak oil, and a lot of people see the energy problem as an engineering problem, and I I see it as an economics problem. And I think it's important to point out. And this water example, I think, brings it out beautifully, that everything is scarce. Uh, It doesn't look scarce when it's priced properly, when we let prices adjust. When we artificially hold prices down, things suddenly get scarce, and we say, gee, there isn't enough to go around. And yet, when we let prices move and adjust freely, there's always enough to go around, which I think gives us the illusion that those things are fine, but the other things, there's a crisis. And it it masks what reality is really about. You want to comment on that? Well, yeah, and I mean the the reason we again we have water crisis is that um, uh, there's no incentive for people to uh, conserve when in fact the the rainfall is off uh, for a year. And uh, right now, the uh, the best thing that's that's happened in in the current uh, um, gasoline uh, situation is that we've allowed prices to go up. Uh, memories are. Sometimes short, but I I remember the early 90s when we imposed uh, price controls on on gasoline, and we had what you would expect uh, uh, long lines at uh, gas stations. I mean, sometimes the lines extended for a mile away from the pump, and uh, and because of the of the controls on the price of gasoline, we actually during that period had uh, uh, oil tankers. Uh, changing course. They were coming to the United States, but they found they could get a better deal in uh, in Europe. And as I understand, the, the gasoline problems in in Europe were far less severe uh, than here. You meant you said the early '90s. I think you meant the early '70s. Yes, the yeah. early '70s. Correct. Sure. And there was a case in. I mean, people forget that when we had these price controls on gasoline in the early uh, '70s, there were literally fist fights. Uh, at gas stations, and gas stations uh, could, would close down early because they'd run out of gas, and and they'd require you know you buy uh, additional services and um, in in addition to the uh, gasoline. Then there was one enterprising little ten year old girl. At least the story I remember is that uh, there was this long line outside of a gas station, again several blocks long, and and she started selling uh, coupons. And telling the people in line that uh, if you want to buy gas from my from my daddy, uh, who owns the gas station, you got to buy one of these ten dollar uh, coupons that entitles you to X gallons of, of gasoline. And of course, she went down the line and kept on going. And uh, when they got to the to the gas pump, they were surprised that they bought uh, worthless uh, coupons. Uh, sounds like that, 
I, I think that story is, is, yeah. is true. I but doubt it, but it's, it's a good not. story anyway. And I think it's it's uh, there are a lot of historical uh, examples of price controls where that kind of behavior was outlawed as part of the the uh, legislation, I think, because yes. even legislators are aware sometimes of how creative people can be. Yes. Uh, not not the um, fake coupons, but the real ones, or you know, requiring someone to buy a can of oil for twenty dollars with their cheap gas. Yes. Um, the reason I mentioned the peak oil thing is that uh, it doesn't matter whether we're running out of oil soon, or in a thousand years, or in fifty years. It doesn't matter whether we've reached the peak of production or not. Uh, what is true always, regardless of where we are in the production path, is that there isn't enough oil to go around at a zero price. That's and it's right. the adjustment of price, which will occur whether we're on the downward slope of the peak or in the rising part of the peak. It is the role of price that makes it plentiful, uh, which is, is why price is so important. And I think people forget that if you control the price, you, you're going to get less supply. There will be fewer gallons of gasoline uh, in our economy if we keep the price at 450 or whatever it is and not allow it to rise to $5 or $6 or wherever it's going. And I, and I suspect that few people in the world uh, know where that price is, is, is going to settle. But you will have less gasoline. That means if, in fact, gasoline is, is critical to... American production, you're going to get less American production, uh, and you're going to get more people standing in line. And when you add the price, the fixed price of gasoline to the wait time uh, of standing in line, you can actually, uh, buyers can actually be paying a higher price uh, yeah. because the supply is restricted, because the price is, uh, is controlled. Right, the full price, especially to people with a higher value of time than the average person or the, the marginal person, is going to actually be quite a bit higher than it was in the mo- when it was uncontrolled. And that, you know, one of the things that happened in the 70s when it was controlled is you had the higher income earners uh, going out and uh, paying teenagers to stand in, uh, yeah. stand in line. Which creates jobs, which is yeah. a bad way to create yeah, so. jobs, a really bad, uh, ineff- inefficient, and dumb yeah. economic policy. Um, we've talked on here before, uh, Milton Friedman suggested that the reason... I like to think that the reason we don't have price controls today, despite the high prices, is because of the vast economic knowledge that has uh, accrued to the American people since the 70s. But Milton Friedman suggested it was really just that enough people were old enough to remember how badly they worked. Um, so we're, I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping there's uh, uh, some economic knowledge that will protect us down the road when uh, people do forget about the 70s. But uh, it's definitely a factor. Well, let's turn to a different issue, uh, the other side of the rainfall issue. We talked about drought. Let's talk about flooding, and you have a lot of interesting observations in the book about flood insurance and federal programs to bail out uh, people underwater, literally and financially. Uh, What are the impacts of good-hearted, even, efforts to help people in times of flood? And we're in the middle of a a very tragic uh, recent set of floods in in Iowa. Well, I... um this, this discussion comes out of another uh, uh, example I love to use in class because it startles students, and that is, in the event of floods, uh, you know, should we feel sorry for the people who are flooded out, or should we feel sorry for the people who are not flooded? And I, I use the example of a, of a river going through a valley, and you have houses down in the valley in the flood uh, plain, and you have houses up on the uh, the mountainside. Which one should we feel sorry for? And, of course, uh, the normal assumption of students is that you should feel sorry for the people in the floodplain because they've obviously had some losses. Well, I, I try to press them. Well, if you expect floods in the floodplain, uh, what do you think is going to happen to the value of the property in, in the floodplain vis-a-vis the value of the property on on the hillside. And the students, uh, uh, you know, they begin to realize that the price of the property in the floodplain is going to be uh, suppressed, and then they can begin to think it through and say, well, you know, if, if in fact the hillside lots and the floodplain lots are pretty much equal or comparable in all regards except for flood damage, the price differential between the two sets of lots 
should, be, should approximate the expected uh, losses uh, when floods uh, come. And so if you have, uh, you know, two, if, if both the lots in the floodplain and those on the hillside are, are valued at 100000 and you expect damages of 20000 then you should expect the price of the floodplain property to fall to 90000 the price of the lots up on the hillside to go up to 110000 If, in fact, the price of the uh, lots on the hillside go to only 105000 which means a $15,000 differential, you should expect people to continue to buy them because if you buy the $90,000 lot, you're going to incur $20,000 of, uh, of flood costs. So it's actually uh, cheaper to buy on the hillside. So you, you can get them to see that the price of the lots on the hillside go up, and the differential will be about $20,000. Well, if you, come, if you come to a flood, and the flood is not as serious as, as expected, but yet causes damage, say of $10,000, then uh, you've got the people in, in the floodplain buying their house for 90000 incurring $10,000 worth of flood costs, which is less than what the people on the hillside paid for their lot, $110,000. So it, it comes back to the question, whom should you feel sorry for, the people who paid the premium for their lot or the people who anticipated the flood and the flood wasn't as serious as they anticipated? Their, their overall costs from the lot plus the Blood damage is, is, is less, and I, I think we've got to uh, we've got to remember that before we just you know in a knee jerk way say oh my God these people have have lost uh, uh, lost property. Some of it is anticipated, you know. If, if in fact it's a flood of the century, then that's a that's another matter. But a lot of people buy in floodplains simply because it is cheaper, and 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 it's uh, the flood losses are kind of cost of uh, Doing business or the cost of living. Now, Russ, what I I, I I go from there, I set them up and I say, well, let's suppose we start taxing the people on the hillside and using the taxes to relieve uh, the damages of the people in the floodplain. What's going to happen? Well, uh, if you tax the hillside, the property there is going to depreciate in value. If you start relieving people of their damages in the floodplain, uh, then more people are going to want to live there, and uh, the price of the property can go up. And not only that, uh, since many, much of their damage is being covered by the people on the hillside, um, they're going to build bigger houses. Uh, they're going to stock them with more valuable uh, furniture. And then they're going to they, live there to start with, which in some places they would just choose not to live there because it would be too, that's right. too risky. And if you start doing that kind of thing, you're likely to have uh, more notable, newsworthy uh, floods because, again, people have an incentive to move into floodplains, and um, uh, as a result, you, you know, you floods, if floods occur out in the wilderness, uh, nobody cares. Uh, it's when they uh, damage people's property. So you can get uh, uh, you know, a greater count of newsworthy uh, floods. It looks like everything's flooding. So, um, and then when, you know, when, the, when they hear that the flood is coming, and oftentimes people know that a flood is coming, uh, if, if they know that their, their damages are going to be uh, uh, covered by the people on the hillside, they have less of incentive to, uh, to pack up their houses and, and get the, uh, so you're going to see more, you know, more couches and lawnmowers and, for that matter, cars uh, floating down, uh, down the river. So it's a real it's a real bind and and I know John Stossel uh, did a report one time I thought was extraordinarily good about how he bought out on the coast of New Jersey or some eastern part of the country uh, and um, uh, and and his he was covered against uh, uh, hurricanes and he couldn't understand why why he a very high income earner uh, would be uh, covered in terms of damages when, in fact, everybody knows that hurricanes come along uh, once in a while. When you say covered, you're not talking about private insurance. I assume you're no, talking no, no. about you're federal. You're talking about, uh, you know, uh, federal subsidies and, and, and flood insurance or, you you know, have disaster relief and uh, and so forth. Of course, part of the problem is is that, as you say, every once in a while there's a flood of the century or a flood like we have now in, in Iowa that's 
dramatically worse than expected. Yep. And um, the, the human heart uh, rightfully goes out to those folks and uh, wants to see them helped. And of course, I, I'm all for voluntary efforts to help them. Uh, I'm just, uh, as I suspect you are, maybe not as enthusiastic about uh, federal efforts, or is that not true? Well, and, and what would you do? Uh, in this case, I just think you've got to be extraordinarily cautious. Uh, it, it just means that, you know, there, the law of unintended consequences uh, can uh, kick in and, and bite you on the butt. Uh, and you, you've just got to realize that there are some disasters maybe that we we can help people out with uh, through uh, government, but it's got to be judicious, got to be very constrained. Uh, uh, if, if it's not constrained, then, then the benefits of these um, uh, programs get capitalized into the value of the property, and you end up helping nobody. Now, go back to the My Valley. Uh, if, in fact, we, in a knee-jerk way, just help all the people in the floodplain, uh, then that means the price of the property is going to go up. The value of the anticipated uh, damage release into the future is going to get capitalized into the value of the property. And so you get people buying there in, into the future that they're paying a higher price. They're already, uh, they've already paid out uh, the cost of these, these damages, and you can, you can really get uh, trapped, and you can end up um, with no gains to the property owners. Again, let me give you an example. A property in the floodplain sells for $90,000 without future benefits uh, coming from the government. There is an anticipated uh, flow of benefits, say, of twenty thousand dollars into the future. Well, th that expe those expected benefits can uh, uh, can get captured or capitalized into the value of the property in the floodplain. So, somebody down the road, say next year, year after that, buys a property for one hundred and ten thousand dollars. Well, that person, you know, is no better off with the flood. Uh, uh, damage benefits than than without them because again the person's paying for the twenty paying the twenty thousand up front. Now you got to understand all these figures are kind of rough and I know you can get more precise in, in making these calculations. But it's a really interesting example and it's not a uh, it's not only an example of um, of floodplain or other types of government subsidies. My the example that comes to mind. Is the taxi cab market in uh, in Manhattan, where to operate a cab you have to have a medallion. The cost of medallion is very high, and um, because uh, they limit the number of of cabs, so getting a medallion is that gives you the right to hire to pick up people. And if you think that's a bad system with so few cabs, which I probably is, probably a lot of people in New York wish there were more, especially when it's raining. Yeah. Then, um, if you start to increase either the number of cabs or medallions, uh, you penalize the people who saved all the money, anticipating the flow of benefits, reasonably so, because that was yeah. the law at the time, legislation at the time, and it gives a certain um, inertia to yeah. government policy. Yeah, it's what Gordon Tullock uh, called the transitionary gains trap. That once you start providing benefits, so often these benefits get get captured. Uh, he, I think he used the example of, of, of the farm subsidies. One of the problems with, of getting out of the farm subsidy uh, business when food prices are so high is that many of these farmers bought their land uh, at prices that were inflated by the anticipated subsidies well into the future. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, they might have a a case that, look, you misled me. Uh, I, I was willing to pay these high prices because you uh, more or less guaranteed, you know, the largesse in, into the future. Of course, some and, people uh, some people are aware of the fact that government doesn't always keep its promises. So it is. Yes, it's an that's interesting. Right. And, and in this case, it might be uh, uh, beneficial. Of course, to the extent that government has a reputation for not keeping its promises, uh, the expected benefits into the future are tempered, and that tempers the increase in uh, uh, the price of, of farmland. Yeah, one of the let, let me Go ahead. Move, move to another issue of the unintended consequence, because I think this is it, it comes close the 9/11 issue that I that I take up in the book. Uh, in the book, I make this, this claim that um, the 9/11 terrorists have probably killed more Americans. 
since 9-11 than they killed on 9-11, and the terrorists have been dead uh, ever since 9-11. And, and the question is, how could you possibly uh, uh, think that is the case? Well, when the terrorists uh, flew those planes into the tw Twin Towers, they immediately increased the risk cost of, of flying. And when the Transportation Security Administration started checking uh, people more carefully, they lengthened the lines at, at airports. That increased the weight cost of, of flying. So the overall cost of flying went up by uh, the risk cost and by the weight cost. And that means that uh, you should have expected uh, more Americans to drive rather than, than fly. And the nation's highways are more deadly than the airways, and as a consequence, you should anticipate uh, more deaths uh, on the nation's highways as a consequence of the growth of the increase in the full cost of flying after 9-11. After and sure enough, three economists at Cornell University have investigated the issue, and they found that in the uh, first 12 months after uh, 9-11. Uh, flying went down by around 5 to 8 percent, depending upon whether it's major or minor uh, airport. Uh, highway travel went up by billions of, of miles that are attributed to the 9-11 event. And they estimated that in the first 12 months, something on the order of 1,250 Americans died on American highways that could not have been projected, given all the uh, models at the time absent 9-11. So you can imagine that uh, uh, in seven or eight years, we could very well have um, uh, had a higher death rate on American highways uh, than we had uh, on 9-11. On it makes you feel better about the high price of gasoline. <laughs> well, saving the high you, price of gasoline a few lives. does have a silver lining, yeah. and one of them is fewer accidents. But what this also suggests for us is that the transportation um, Security Administration has to be very careful about raising the alert status uh, at airports because if it hears of a rumor, just a rumor, they don't know whether it's right or wrong, uh, but they think there's going to be a terrorist attack, and as a result, they raise the alert status from uh, what uh, yellow to orange. Uh, that can lengthen lines at airports. It can increase the jitters that people have. Uh, it can literally drive people to the highways, and as a consequence, uh, the Transportation Security Administration uh, can indeed uh, uh, cause uh, the deaths of Americans on highways. And so they have a real balancing act here about uh, trying to save lives in the air versus uh, uh, the impact of uh, their efforts on, on highway deaths. Well, to, as far as I can tell, they, they do keep it at orange all the time. Uh, a strange um, phenomenon. It, it, I've made reference to the uh, the sign in the saloon that set the permanent sign that says "free beer tomorrow," and uh, orange alert is a very constantly uh, strikes me as a real tragic example of um, of bureaucratic um, yeah. ineffectiveness. Uh, but I, I want to tell a, a quick story, Richard, about your co-author Dwight Lee. Yes. Right after 9-11, Dwight invited me to the University of Georgia where he teaches to give a talk um, uh, on uh, spontaneous order. Yeah. And I, I was a little nervous. It was only about a month or so after 9-11. But I told Dwight I was going to come anyway. And I flew at the time I was, uh, was in St. Louis. I flew out to, to Atlanta. And when I got there, I was immediately called my wife to reassure her that I was fine. The plane had landed safely. There was no problems. As you say, there were a lot of jitters. People were very nervous flying yeah. then, and it was um, it was a bit scary. But I got there fine, and then I University of Georgia, as you know, is in Athens, which is, I don't know, maybe 40, 50 miles from Atlanta. I think it's more like a two-hour drive from the airport. Okay, so let's say a two-hour drive. Let's say it's about 100 miles. Well, it's on a two-lane road, most of it, as I remember it. So I'm in a shuttle bouncing along a two-lane road uh, in the middle of the night. It wasn't raining, but that would have made it just uh, even better. Yeah. And that must have been many, many times more dangerous than my uh, airplane flight. But I didn't call my wife when I arrived safely in Athens. I called her when I arrived safely in Atlanta, which was, was a mistake. I should have told her I was fine after the, the Athens trip. Um, 
The Holiday Inn at Athens, by the way, was very uh, on top of the 9-11 uh, uh, precautions. And I, I reassured them that I didn't think they were in the top 25 on lists for the uh, the next terrorist assault. But in those days, again, people were so nervous, they were um, very vigilant. Uh, and, that, that has changed, I think, and, and, wisely. And, and what this suggests is that... Uh, you know, the TSA has got to be very careful about how it allocates its resources. If it checks, you know, grand, 95-year-old grandmothers, gives them careful screening, or, or you know, five-month-old babies, uh, they're diverting resources from checking other people. They can, in fact, be lengthening the, those lines. And as a consequence, they can be driving Americans to the highways by, uh, by failure to, um, uh, to use common sense. And, and and recognize that you know lots of uh, profiles just don't 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 apply. Yeah, the problem though, I think you're right. The problem though is that we live in an open society, which I treasure and cherish. And the rules that that Homeland Security and the TSA uses are pretty well known. So if it became known that they didn't that they you know, wisely skip 95-year-old grandmothers, they would become well, a, an attractive way to, to do some damage. You want to live in a, if you want to have safety, you got to give up uh, some of that openness and transparency. And it's a little bit... Um, well, I, I understand that argument very well. And, uh, and it's just a matter of using some, you know, judiciousness in, in, in some of these things. Uh, of course, you can always plant a bomb on a grandmother, yep. uh, especially if they have a winner. Uh, if, if the grandmother has a winter coat on, but if the grandmother has, you know, just a sleek dress, uh, you know, it just, uh, it's just, it's one of those things where they've got to be very, very careful. It's a real management problem, and uh, just, full food. I, I worry about rules that, uh, that don't allow people to use any discretion at all. No, I agree. By the same token, you know, you, you can if uh, the TSA can increase the efficiency of of the checks, get those lines down, uh, then they can actually save American lives. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, they don't have much of an incentive to do that. I, you know, I was traveling on Mother's Day recently, going to see my mom, and um, I was struck by how badly it was being run that day. There were there was one place. One screening station open. The line was backing up, and you know what's the cost to them? Well, yes. if it gets really bad, I guess I could complain to my to Congress, uh, maybe, and maybe they'd listen. But it's a very indirect form of feedback. And the more interesting thing to me was you can't complain to them because they'll strip search you. You know that you just yeah, you got to kind of smile when they drop your laptop or. Uh, or paw through your underwear. You got to just pretend that it's just the greatest thing in the world because their authority is is a little bit open ended. Yes, and I uh, the only I, t I take this uh, issue up in in the popcorn book mainly as a way of of suggesting to you know Congress or whatever that uh, the TSA needs to its its um, its mandate needs to be broadened a bit that uh, it ought to be held responsible or. For for highway deaths, or at least uh, you know its beneficial effects in, in uh, the air airways business uh, should be balanced off against reports on on highways. Yeah, if they let the lines go, if they can get the lines moving more quickly, they can hire more staff. That would yeah. be uh, or some other uh, some other kind of work, maybe a higher salary. Yeah. Um, let's switch gears. Let's take an example that that I found very interesting. I didn't completely agree with you. Why are there so many sales after Christmas? And this is one of the examples, again, in the book that I really like because most people, especially people who haven't studied economics, have a very quick, easy answer, and the economist has a little richer answer. So why are there so many sales after Christmas? Well, the, the standard answer uh, from my MBA, executive MBA students is that they're just trying to get rid of unwanted uh, inventories. That is, they bought too many pink and green uh, shirts, oddball kinds of things, and they're just trying to rid their, get their inventories down, maybe for, uh, for tax purposes. And I'd say, yeah, but you know, there are sales of that uh, sort after, after Christmas. But you know, what we observe in malls is store-wide uh, sales, 25 percent off of everything. And uh, what can we conclude about the buyer who 
buyers too much of, of everything. Of course, buyers are going to make mistakes on some items, but everything? Uh, what should you do? Uh, it, especially if that buyer uh, has excess inventories of everything year after year after year. And, and, and they generally come around to the fact that, uh, you know, the buyer's either got to improve, improve uh, his or her performance or, or the person gets fired. Well, the, the point that I'm trying to get across with my students and in the book is that many of these um, after Christmas sales are planned, and they have to be planned because the buyers have to place their orders back in, well, as early as, well, at least by July. And, and basically, they're, they're sort of counting on uh, after Christmas sales. And, and it isn't so much that they're necessarily giving discounts after uh, Christmas as they, uh, they know that they've got you know, two different markets. One market before Christmas where people have a certain urgency to get something to put underneath the Christmas tree. And then they have another market uh, after Christmas where you know, people have pretty much spent out uh, they've got their their closets and and the cabinets are full, and uh, uh, they just don't have the urgency uh, to buy. And 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 we in economics say, you know, well, the demand before Christmas is more inelastic uh, than after Christmas, or you have an inelastic demand before Christmas and an elastic demand uh, uh, after Christmas. And and when you have those differences. By elastic, uh, you, you mean more you responsive. Have, you have different profit-maximizing prices uh, for for firms, and so there's a uh, the point I'm pushing in in, in the book there and, and other topics is uh, that this is just a good form of of, of price discrimination. Now, I know you and John uh, Lott have um, have raised the issue of uh, of cost differences uh, in such uh, circumstances. And I I don't want to. De- I, I'd say, yeah, that's a good explanation, but um, well, not well, here, I, not I, in this case. I've got a different explanation, but go ahead, keep going. <laughs> well, anyway, you, what you what you do is you just uh, if people have got to have it before Christmas, then you just elevate uh, the price, and if they don't have to have it after Christmas, if they have more time on their hands and so forth in that week of, of vacation, uh, then you you lower the price. And uh, again, I'll, I'll I'll concede you cost differences, but uh, uh, the other point, as I explained to John, I, I don't see price discrimination as necessarily uh, the monopoly bad that uh, lots of people do. Go ahead, uh, Russ, and well, give me your... Well, first, I want to mention a couple of weeks ago, I did a podcast with a sales manager of a car dealership that I bought a car from. We talked about the strange world of new car prices and and, um, and, and haggling and how... Some people are very uncomfortable in that situation. Other people are a little more comfortable. But yeah. uh, after that podcast, a friend of mine said to me he'd been shopping for some product. Some product I don't remember what it was. And he, he said there was a sign on the, the wall. It said, if you want to haggle, uh, we'll raise the price so you can uh, bargain us down and get a bargain. So it, it is a interesting world, the world of bargains and, and haggling and – before we talk about this particular case of Christmas sales, I want you to talk a little bit more about the conditions for price discrimination because I want to use uh, use some of those in, in in trying to give you an alternative argument. And I want to it'll come up again. When we talk about popcorn, which I want to turn to next. So talk about what what price discrimination, the idea behind price discrimination, well, what it is, and what first, why it's yeah. a profit maximizing strategy, and in what situations. Well, the, the basic situations, that, you know, the classic explanation is that first off, the the firm has to have some pricing power. Uh, some people would call that monopoly power, uh, and then the other uh, condition that it can't be, you know, it can't be easily uh, resold. Uh, so if you, you know, if you have two different markets, uh, uh, then if you sell at the lower price in market A. If those people can can resell it with ease in in market B, which is being charged a higher price, uh, then then the price discrimination uh, can break down a bit. Now it's a little bit hard at Christmas time. Uh, for you to yeah, do you that. need a time you machine. Low. You need a time machine. Yeah, so it's, you need a time machine. You buy low after Christmas, but you can't sell it before Christmas. Uh, you can hold it though till the next Christmas, but they're carrying costs. I'm going to not going to use that argument, but that but you're basically right there. It's you can't. It's hard to resell. 
But it, it, these uh, the the after Christmas sales are beginning uh, to, to break down a bit, though, and they're breaking down because you know if you start lowering your price by you know say forty percent after Christmas, then some store can get the bright idea. Well, if I'm if on December twenty seventh I, I have to sell it for forty percent less, why not on December twenty four I sell it for fifteen percent uh, less than the posted price? So you get other people giving pre-Christmas sales, and some of that is uh, is emerging. Then stores have gotten into uh, competition over the gift cards, and people have realized that they can buy gift cards, give them on, you know, on Christmas, and then the person gets the benefit of the gift plus uh, can buy more uh, in the after uh, Christmas sales. So, so these sales are 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 beginning to break down, as oftentimes uh, happens with uh, with good old fashioned. A competition. Well, the the definition of price discrimination is is charging to the same, excuse me, charging two different people different prices for the same good. And in the paper you mentioned that John Lott and I wrote a while back, we were talk often we raised the point that well, a lot of times the cost of servicing a particular customer is not the same as the cost of a, this, another customer, and that you'd want to take that into account. Now, in the case of Christmas, the thing that comes to my mind and Two things come to mind. I'll give you a chance to respond to them. One is retail business is extremely competitive. Uh, I don't see a lot of pricing power there. So that that argument, which is often invoked, by the way, for restaurants as well to explain certain pricing puzzles, I find very strange because most restaurants and most retailers are in a desperate struggle to, to stay afloat. And if you suggested to them that they have market power and the ability to raise price – to, to some customers in hopes of making extra profit on them, it strikes me as a lot of times unlikely. That's my first challenge, is that it seems to me to be a, a place where pricing uh, is extremely competitive. My second example, though, would be the following. Let me Russ, wanna, can I respond to that. Sure, go ahead. Um, let, me, let me suggest that um, in, in, in economics, we're, we're sort of fixed on this idea of, of price competition being the only uh, – Source of, of, of meaningful competition, and I would I would argue that um, you know the retail industry is in fact uh, extremely competitive because of things like the ability to to price discriminate. It's a kind of Joseph uh, Schumpeter point because there there are uh, economic profits to be made as a result of um, a price discrimination or pricing. Power. You have all of these goods coming out on out on on the market, and you have all these people willing to risk a you know a sizable investment uh, in in order to get the uh, the economic profit. Um, I I kind of you know economists hold up this sort of perfect uh, competitive market as as some sort of ideal, and just think how competitive a market would be in terms of variety of goods and energy if in fact all potential for uh, economic profit and by that I mean profit above you know the absolute minimum if in fact all the economic profit could would have you know evaporate once somebody uh, uh, created a, a, a product and uh, so I would I would say that you know some of this uh, extreme competitiveness is, is a consequence of the strong incentive people have to um, uh, to go after these unusually high profits, many of them fail at it. I want you to know that, but they still go after it by willing to open stores uh, by the dozens and and so forth. Well, I, I agree with you on the the benefits from short run profit yeah. uh, that Schumpeter was was obviously talking about. the The opportunity to make money in the short run uh, does create the incentive for innovation, and it's very very important. And I, I don't want to deny that. But to stick with the Christmas story, okay. I, I want to agree with you a little bit uh, that that non-price competition is important. But the, what I would use, what I would think would be important here, that I that you certainly I know you're aware of, but you seem to to dismiss it, is availability. So when you suggest that the buyer is is inept because year in and year out the buyer buys too much, I, I would suggest that one way is a very, very important way that stores compete is by keeping the shelf stocked. And there's nothing more 
uh, I think unpleasant to a customer and then find that, that in America anyway, that a store is out. And the reason we, we're, we're so accustomed to seeing stock on the shelves because that's just what we've we expect, and so it becomes a form of a place that that firms compete on. And so I would, in particular, in in the in the time before Christmas, uh, running out of a key item, and I'm not talking about a fad item, but just general things like shirts and gifts that are standard gifts that people give each other, scarves, etc., would be extremely costly to to a department store. And so I assume they overstock on purpose to minimize the chance, not minimize, but to reduce the chance. Of, of running out of, of anything that is going to be key, and they can't predict what is going to be the most attractive gift in advance or what kind of trends they can, they can guess. So I assume, you know, again, I, I, I certainly agree with you that you don't want to push the so-called perfect competition model, a model that I think is very powerful and useful but easily leads to silly conclusions when yeah. taken too far. But I think it's a really important part of the American economy, and the fact that the, stel- the shelves are stocked is... Um, a key form of competition. Well, I, I, you know, I don't want to dismiss that argument at all. I, you know, sometimes you can only focus on one, and and, and I think in in the book I probably uh, underplayed it. And I, I think um, uh, you and John John Lott again, uh, you know, really did a great job in, in pointing out that one of the reasons for the last minute, the high price of of uh, airline tickets at the last minute. Is that the airlines are indeed trying to provide uh, those last-minute customers with a service? Uh, that is, they're 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 reserving some seats uh, uh, for people who have to fly because of business or maybe uh, uh, deaths in the family, and uh, and and they know that if they reserve them to the last, um, you know, to the last minute. Uh, there's a good chance that those seats are going to go unfilled. And I think that's a very that's a, incisive point. And that cost and will be lost then because you can't re- ever get that money back once the, that's, once that's the plane right. takes it's, off. It's, it's, it clearly is a, is a part of the story. And, in fact, I think, I think what we're saying here is that, you know, that there, you know there are combo explanations for many of the uh, pricing systems uh, that we have out there. Well, I've come to a slightly more... Um, I don't know. I, I'm less dogmatic on this than I used to be, and I, yes. my listeners will have heard this in other podcasts that we've talked about. I thought that was an interesting argument we made. I don't know if it's right. I'm struck by the fact that uh, Southwest doesn't have two week weekend, uh, you know, booking in advance discounts. They have some discounts, and they do have some last minute higher fares. But uh, you know, the world of pricing. One lesson I've learned, and I will let's turn to the popcorn example because I think it's a great example of it. It, it's so complicated. Those of us on the outside who think we understand why things happen often have such an imperfect institutional knowledge of what's really going on in the business. Even the players in the business don't understand it, uh, but they're driven by competition to come up with what is often a good price uh, or a good strategy, such as keeping the the, sh- the stocks shelved at a, at a higher inventory cost. So let, let's um, let, let's turn to the uh, example of popcorn. Why is popcorn expensive? Give us the standard answer that you hear from the well, person in the street and what some of the things that person's missing. Well, when some people hear about my book title, Why Popcorn Costs So Much at the Movies and Other Pricing Puzzles, uh, they they oftentimes will mutter, well, it's it's obvious. Uh, it's movie theaters are just monopolists, and once they get you through the turnstile... They can uh, charge they, whatever they want. <laughs> Sir? They can charge whatever they want. That's right, because there are no vendors. Other vendors are allowed, and so it's just uh, uh, it's it's whatever they want. And I'd say, well, if they can charge whatever they want, why do they stop at five dollars and fifty cents for the small bag of popcorn? Why not ten dollars, twelve dollars, and uh, and 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 so forth? And and I've just been amazed that how this uh, this issue has evolved in my my own thinking and even since I published the book it's I think I've gotten a better understanding and it and it is far more complicated than most people think because they don't understand uh, a very important part about the about the movie industry and that is the movie industry is selling a bundled uh, experience that can be composed of a movie and popcorn and a soda uh, and there's an interplay uh, necessary interplay between the price of popcorn and the price of 
of theater uh, tickets, and then uh, the percentage take that the studios get for the movies uh, out of the, the ticket prices. Well, I think there's a, uh, a, a more sophisticated answer by, by recognizing that there's some price discrimination going on in the popcorn prices, uh, and this kind of pricing strategy is used at Starbucks, it's used at McDonald's, and um, all over the place. And, and the, the argument is basically can be seen in terms of the pricing structure here in Southern California. Uh, a small bag of popcorn uh, costs $5.50. You get about four ounces of popcorn there, and that means you're paying about a dollar and thirty-seven and a half cents an ounce, and that seems extraordinarily expensive. Um, uh, in fact, I, I checked the price of play mignon at Costco, and, and popcorn on a per ounce basis of the theater is about two, two and a third times the price of filet mignon per ounce uh, at, at Costco. Now, the comparison's not completely fair, but anyway, we're, well, we're talking... You know, one, one difference being that they, they don't cook the filet mignon for you at Costco, that's which right. is one of your observations. And, uh, and that's got to be kept <laughs> in mind. And But the price of, um, of uh, uh, popcorn per ounce uh, at... Um, at a movie, is, at a theater, is about on par with the pr- price of uh, sirloin at, at Outback, uh, at being served with you know a vegetable and, and so forth. So there is there does seem to be an unreasonable expense there, and I'll get to whether or not it's reasonable in a minute. But do notice that here in Southern California, you can go from the small bag to the medium bag, and the you're going to double your popcorn. You're going to get about uh, eight ounces, four additional ounces. Those additional ounces are twelve and a half cents an ounce. You go to the big tub. Well, here in Southern California, you stand a, a good chance of getting more popcorn in the tub, but you also stand some chance of getting less of uh, popcorn uh, in that in that tub. Uh, if you're going to buy a, a, a tub, uh, you've got to you got to count on getting the refills in order to get a you know a better deal than on the medium. And, and by the way, the reason you can uh, you can get more in the medium than in the tub is that the tub's size sides are inflexible. Uh, the medium bag is 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 flexible, and as a result, the concession clerk can actually stuff it in. You know, cause those sides to expand. And I I have a video where I actually empty the popcorn out of the tub, pour the medium into the into the tub, and it over. It overflows. Well, so how much is the eight ounces, and how much? How much is the medium, and how much is the tub? Oh, the medium is six dollars fifty cents more, twelve and a half cents per additional ounce over the over the small bag. Then the tub is a dollar more, but you get um, uh, you get free refills. And so, whether or not that's that tub is worth the extra buck depends upon your willingness to uh, to get refills. And a lot of moviegoers don't seem to to be aware. Of the free refills, many of them do. It varies greatly as to whether they get the uh, the refills. Anyway, you can you can see that if you get, I, I think if you get two refills on the tub, and some people do, in fact, they get a refill during the movie, then they'll get a refill on their way out of the movie. If in fact you 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 consume three tubs, uh, the, the added cost of per per ounce of popcorn is something like uh, uh, eight cents an ounce. So. You know, there's a high price of popcorn uh, in the small thing, but in the as you get weigh it on the margin, the uh, price of popcorn uh, goes way down, which suggests something about, in my view, uh, their 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 cost structure. But you've got to understand that if, in fact, they're making a good deal of profit on on the popcorn, and many theaters do view themselves not in the movie business but in the concession business then you've got to understand that they have a very strong incentive to get people up to the counter. And to get, they want to get them through the turnstile so the, uh, the theaters have an incentive to keep the price of tickets down. They don't, and, and they want to keep the tickets down so that they can raise the price of, of, of popcorn. Well, theaters have to bid for, the, uh, uh, you know, for their movies. And some of them can bid, you know, I understand from Art Devaney, uh, a retired economist from here at UCI who's an entertainment economist, that the typical movie contract uh, gives about, for major movies, about 70% of the gate receipts to the, to the theaters. Well, if you have 
Uh, if you're giving up 70 cents on the dollar at the gate... You mean to the, to the distributor, not to the theater. You said, that's right. Or right. to the studio or distributor yeah. or whatever. 30% of the gate goes to the theater. That's right. Yeah, and ahead. then you have this um, uh, product called popcorn that has a hefty uh, margin on it, that is, at the margin. Uh, then you can imagine the theaters uh, have an interest in trying to get the price of popcorn down. They lose a dollar, say, on the ticket, but they can put that dollar on the popcorn, and they lose 30 cents on the ticket, gain maybe 90 cents at the margin uh, on the uh, popcorn, and they can uh, increase their overall uh, take. Uh, and as a consequence, if they have a movie that they think is going to be a blockbuster, uh, then they'll bid more in terms of percentage uh, uh, gate. And so the, the studios can actually get a higher price uh, for their blockbusters, even though the ticket price remains remains the same. I mean, I, I've heard that uh, uh, the take on, on the tickets can go up 90, 90%, 95%. And again, the reason they're willing to bid so much is uh, they can get people through the turnstile and sell them the high margin uh, item, that is, high margin on the margin. Well, And, and Russ, I, I think uh, you did an excellent job in taking up this issue, and I wish I'd read your piece before that's all right. uh, Here, here's, I wrote the book. No problem. Here's the question I have about this. I, first, I want to I want to remind people, we started off with this story that said, you know, once you come into the theater, you're stuck. And, of course, as you point out, that doesn't let the theater charge as much as they want because people can still decide not to eat the popcorn. The more important point is that if you know this after the first time, maybe you'd be disappointed. If the popcorn was $15, you might be desperately hungry or it's such an important part of the experience, you might pay it once. But you don't have to go back to the theater, and the theater that charges a reasonable price for concessions – is going to have an easier time attracting people. And we'd expect competition across theaters to bid the price down to where the margin of profit was enough to keep them in business but not excessive. And again, I would argue it'd be hard to imagine they could price discriminate unless there were limitations on entry into the business. And, and there may be, by the way, which I, I'm, you know, don't, I'm not an expert on the movie business. But I, I do think it's important to, to remind people that as you point out in the book, that what a let's forget this price discrimination issue. Let's just look at the so-called high margin on popcorn. Part of it may be because they are competing on getting access to the best movies, lowering the tickets prices, making sure uh, that they draw people into the theater. Part of it is just the fact that the costs are not obvious. There's yes. an oper- there's the labor cost, which I referred to earlier. There's the opportunity cost of the space. Obviously, the theater would be dramatically smaller and have a lower rent or would have more seats and more theaters if you didn't have concessions. And, of course, as, as you mentioned and as, as obvious to anybody who's ever been to the movies, if concessions get expensive enough, people do bring in their own – even if it's against the rules of the theater, people will bring in items in their in their pockets or before they come to the theater in their bodies. They'll, they'll eat before they come. So it, it is, a I think, a very complex issue – that on the face of it appears obviously to be an example of being the exploitation of consumers. When you think about it a little bit more, it, it is more complicated. Yeah, and most people who go through the turnstile, they see the price of popcorn, and, and they, they seem to have two views on it. One is they look to the cost of popping the popcorn at, at home in terms of the kernel cost and the oil cost, and that's about 55, 75 cents according to my uh, calculations. They forget about the labor cost of their time. Uh, if somebody uh, uh, values his or her time at, at, at $20 an hour and takes about a half an hour to get out the popper, do the popping, clean up, and you know, put it into a bag and willing to smuggle it into a theater, uh, and it takes a half an hour, that means that, bag, that uh, tub of popcorn is going to cost 10 to 11 Eleven dollars, which is uh, more expensive than the price of the uh, uh, theater popcorn. The other uh, thing I think people imagine that the world would be a better place if we just had a whole bunch of popcorn vendors lined up around the lobby uh, walls, and they don't realize that if you did have such an environment, uh, the price, the competitive price, would dis- descend toward the marginal cost, which is the cost of the popcorn and the oil. And there'd be no margin uh, enough to cover the cost of uh, 
the overhead, the labor, the uh, well, maybe some of the labor, but certainly not the uh, the theater itself. So if there weren't some, if there weren't some, you know, significant economic profits in in, in the movie business, you, you'd have um, you'd have a lot, a lot fewer theaters, and you'd probably have a lot of a uh, lot fewer uh, movies uh, uh, made available. And, well, and by the way, uh, uh, it could be that one of the reasons we're having an onslaught of new major motion pictures is is because you know there is there is money to be had in in uh, in popcorn, well, which I... enables theaters to bid high prices for the. Uh, for the films, which enables the, uh, the filmmakers to go through all these elaborate, uh, spectacular uh, special effects. And creates comfortable movie theaters with drink holders and nice and, seats. And, and, and by the way, you know, there may be some, you know, a good deal of profit on, on, the, uh, on the popcorn, but you've got to weigh that off against the cost of everything else. And, and I, I haven't checked on, you know, the health, the financial health of, of the theater industry here recently. But when I was writing the book, writing this chapter, uh, one thing you didn't want to do is, is buy Edwards uh, theaters because there was an overexpansion of, of theaters at, at the time and, and the financial health of Edwards was somewhat uh, shaky. Regal actually um, bought them out. So uh, you got to realize, again, I think as you've pointed out, that... Uh, um, we have an entertainment market that's fairly competitive. Theaters are competing uh, with sporting events, and they're also now uh, competing with themselves on on DVDs. Sure, and against all kinds of things that that are pleasant and, to and do. And I, you know, I have reservations about. I mean, I just find it difficult to understand how they're going to be able to, to uh, offer something better than you can get in a in a home theater. Uh, the quality of plasma and LCDs is is far higher, at least from my vantage point, uh, than the quality that you can get uh, in a movie theater. Of course, you get the huge screen, but now we can get screens that you know are pretty sizable in our in our living rooms for fairly modest costs. No, I think that the only two things that are going to keep the industry going are the the thrill of seeing a movie with a bunch of people, which has negatives as well as positives, and of course that unique flavor of the movie popcorn, which we have not talked about. It doesn't t- taste quite the same at home. Um, they do stuff to it, I guess. They sprinkle some stuff on it, and they uh, pop it a little bit differently than we do. Well, it's it's theater popcorn is designed to sell. It's designed to create the sense of urgency, and in the industry, they they call it a smellable, audible. Uh, uh, edible. <laughs> uh, they, some movie theaters will pop a bunch of popcorn, uh, in a day or so before uh, the uh, the screenings, and then but they, they'll make sure to pop some popcorn at the time of the of the screenings just to get that smell uh, throughout the uh, of the lobbies. And by the way, one of the reasons and one of the major reasons for your uh, multi-screen theater complexes is to make a more efficient use of um, of the concession counters. Again, you it's and a very, you very and John, important point uh, made the point that be, when you have one theater and one concession uh, counter, uh, that concession counter is idle uh, for you know an hour and a half out of out of every hour, out of every two hour movie. If you have eighteen screens, then you can have a constant flow of people through the lobby and the call center. Or lower. Uh, and if I'm right, John and I were right about that. And again, I, I want to emphasize I, I don't, we didn't prove anything in that paper. We just raised the possibility that some of these explanations that people offer maybe are not right. I, again, I, I don't think, I think these are very complicated issues. Uh, I'm a big fan of competition, I think it's very powerful. But I think it's interesting how both sides of this debate have done a pretty bad job. Uh, on the empirical side of, of things. And when I say both sides of the debate, I don't mean the popcorn debate. I mean the issue of how competitive any particular market is. Yeah. But but it's an interesting thing. If, if it is true that competition is a powerful force in the concession business and in the popcorn business, and that it's hard to price discriminate as a result in, say, the sizing or just the, the price of a bag between high-end consumer, high-intensity consumers, high... Uh, inelastic consumers and those whose demands are more responsive. If that's true, then you would think that the more efficient multi-screen theaters would drive down 
the price of popcorn to the consumer because those costs savings of having the the uh, concession stand open through the whole time without the downtime where you have employees doing nothing, maybe sweeping up a little bit, but basically doing nothing as opposed to the situation with the multi-screen, you'd expect to see the real price over time falling relative uh, to other other types of uh, of what popcorn had been in the past. And I don't know if that's true. Interesting empirical question. Well, one of the issues, one of the reasons I don't think you were able to find uh, – lower price popcorns at the multi-screen complexes, is that uh, the, the efficiency gains in those multi-screen complexes can be uh, revealed and an increase in the, the film budgets. That is, because uh, their efficiencies at popcorn, more profitable theaters can bid more for the, uh, for the movies, and as a consequence of bidding more for the movies, you can have films come out like Indiana Jones that are just filled with... Uh, uh, with special, uh, very expensive uh, special effects. So there may be, uh, uh, you know, the improvements in efficiency of delivering popcorn can show up in in higher quality films or more costly films. Uh, I, I like personally. that. I like that theory. It's very clever. Uh, yeah. It would. It is strange, though, that the price of popcorn and the price of tickets are bundled that way, and I think. Normally, I would you would expect if if that were true, you would normally expect then that that movies would get more expensive over time, uh, independently of their um, of their other costs. So, but I'm, let me say that more carefully: as we get wealthier and prosperous as a nation, we demand better and better movies. Yes. Those get provided by the theaters. We would pay for them normally through higher ticket prices. You're suggesting it's possible we're paying through we're paying for them through higher margin popcorn. Which I would find more plausible, uh, which I would find implausible. But as you point out, there are various uh, Supreme Court decisions that have artificially affected the mix of concession and ticket revenue, and distribution and theater revenue than than would otherwise exist. Isn't that right? Yes. Um, uh, and and really, I'm leaning on Art Devaney uh, again. He's an entertainment. Uh, Economist has a great book out called Hollywood Economics. If anybody wants to go into it, uh, we had a Supreme Court decision in 1948, uh, antitrust decision that forced studios to divest themselves of their their theaters. And the argument was that the the old uh, vertical integration led to a monopoly uh, pricing in in the movie business. That is, studios could give their films only to these theaters, and those theaters could charge. Uh, more than the competitive bizarre. rate of return. What a bizarre idea! If 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 that if that theory were in fact the case, you should have expected uh, the price of uh, theater tickets and popcorn to fall in the decade or so after 1948. But they did exactly the opposite. I don't recall how much they they rose, but uh, the price increase for tickets was something some multiple of the increase in the consumer price index. And again, uh, the price increase was attributable, tri- attributed, or can be attributed to that 1948 decision. That is, what it did is introduce some some inefficiencies into the movie industry. And 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 by the way, the the movie industry is one of the riskiest business uh, around. Uh, it's very hard for movie executives to uh, predict uh, what movies will succeed. Uh, there is what uh, Art Devaney calls extreme kurtosis uh, in this movie. That's a statistical concept, but it means that basically no one knows anything or can count on much of anything. That's a slightly less uh, technical term for it. Yeah. <laughs> and kurtosis it, is one way of describing it. The other is uh, hopeless ignorance of the future. Yeah. Well, and, and, and part of it stems from the fact that, that movies are themselves unique uh, products. It's not like, you know, one Mercedes, two Mercedes, three Mercedes. It's Indiana Jones and Miss Potter and, and whatever that have their own, uh, uh, they just become a product un- unto themselves. And so you do all the work, you invest all the money beforehand, and, and so much of um, uh, how well a movie does depends upon the buzz uh, on the opening. And it also depends upon what other, other movies are opening uh, on, on that weekend. And so you can have a movie that just happens to come out with uh, some other big uh, 
uh, movies and gets swamped and, and leaves the theater in a week or two. And, and by the way, the runs on these movies, is the average is something like uh, seven weeks, and, and some of them stay only four weeks. And so uh, one of the reasons prices don't vary for movies is, is studios and, and theaters are very concerned about jacking up the price and causing fewer people to, um, to go. And when you have fewer people to go, you, you can have less of a buzz and you can have less uh, attendance down the road. So there's a, there's a tendency to try to keep that price down, not, not buck the, the trend, and hopefully you'll get the, the buzz going. And you do have films like uh, you know, Sex in the City that here in Southern California, uh, my wife told me that the, uh, the line was about three, uh, three blocks long. Uh, for that, and, and they did get that buzz going. But part of the problem with the movies, too, is that if you have an actor who can guarantee a successful opening and profit, uh, that actor is in a position to charge a very high fee and, as a consequence, uh, drain the profits uh, from, uh, from the movies. So it, there, was, there was some logic to this arrangement that we had in the 40s where the studios owned the theaters. Because it, it made sure that the studios had theaters uh, where they could show their films. It made sure that they didn't have to negotiate uh, with every theater uh, on the films. And then they could sort of develop bundles of movies that can, um, can eliminate some of the risk that comes with having individual films going here, there, uh, and, and yonder. And then with the, the integrated industry, uh, they were better able to balance you know, the price of the concessions and, and the price of the tickets. Well, yeah, to just, to again, just to, to mention it one more time, the complexity is, is very difficult to uh, cut through from the outside. And even from the inside, I would suspect that in many industries, uh, insiders have trouble understanding why prices are what they are. What, what they discover is if they charge the wrong price, they go out of business. Uh, so they may not know why price is the way it is. And just, just to close with a classic example, we're running short on time. We've talked here before about uh, why women's uh, dry cleaning is more expensive than men's dry cleaning to, dry, to clean a shirt. And it turns out when you look more closely at that, there, there's about a thousand reasons that have nothing to do with price discrimination, yes. which is the standard answer. But there are a thousand reasons why women's clothing might be more expensive to dry clean than men's. For one, they're different fabrics. The men's shirt actually isn't dry cleaned, it's laundered. Uh, the machines are different sizes, an argument I don't find compelling, but that's a standard thing you hear. But, but the deepest thing I once heard, and again, I don't know if it's true, but it's an example of how complicated this, these kind of puzzles are if you really want to get to the answer as opposed to have a good time talking about it. And we've had a very good time talking about it, and I think that's a lot of what economics brings to bear in these discussions. It gives you a thoughtful framework for organizing your thinking. In the case of women's dry cleaning, someone told me, and again, I like to hear from someone in the business, that women are more likely to return their shirts for recleaning or for damages than men are, which means that a woman, a female customer or female clothing is more expensive to dry clean, and we'd expect competition to force women's prices higher than men's. If you naively just charge the same price because you thought it was the right thing to do, you'd find yourself going out of business. So well, I, I just, agree, and, and what was great about writing this book is I, I, I saw it, came to see it as a discovery process. I'd start off with some question like, you know, why does popcorn cost so much at movies? And, and keep uh, drilling down on it. And it just got more and more uh, interesting. And many of the arguments that uh, everybody think knows is the right argument turned out to have uh, flaws, or at least there were other arguments to complement it. Uh, you know, why coupons? Uh, every economist thought that one up to uh, price discrimination, too. But uh, that sort of makes you wonder if, if, in fact, coupons just enable firms to make uh, economic profits, then why did Procter, Procter & Gamble uh, organize a cartel of two coupon distributors uh, to try to suppress uh, the distribution of, of coupons? Yeah. And uh, they they were taken to court by the by the consumers uh, on that. So anyway, all these issues I, I found uh, uh, 
fascinating the more I, I got into them and I continued to uh, to learn as I uh, as I talk to others and read and, 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 and think about the issues. Well, you raised a lot of interesting puzzles in the book and you gave a lot of, I thought, very interesting uh, insights and answers. My guest today has been Richard McKenzie, the Walter B. Gherkin Professor of Enterprise and Society at the University of California, Irvine. He is the author of Why Popcorn Costs So Much of the Movies and Other Pricing Puzzles. Richard, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Good to be with you, Ross. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.